Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to be in verses 13 all the way through verse 30. Uh, read a story about a wealthy New York businessman who had a two-week trip planned to Europe for different business operations that he was taking part in. And he drove a Rolls Royce, and he wanted to find a good place uh, to, uh, to take care of it. So he goes down to the local bank where he does all of his banking. They knew him very well. And they knew him to be exceedingly wealthy, and, and, and he said, I would like to take a loan out for $5,000. The bank informed him that he would not need to have some sort of collateral, I guess, to make that happen. And so he said, no problem, here are the keys to my Rolls Royce. And so the bank then dutifully took his Rolls Royce, parked it in their expensive parking garage underneath their property. He goes off for two weeks, transacts his business, comes back, and he settles an account with the bank. So it's $5,000, and the banker said, that'd be fine. You can pay the principal. It's also $15.40 in interest. So no problem. He added that on to the check. As he was signing his name and handing it over, the banker said, sir, we know you very well, and we're just all very curious. Why did you take a loan out for $5,000? He said, well, where else can I park my Rolls Royce in New York City? (laughs) for $15.40 for two weeks. (laughs) Now, I know that all of you are going to be thinking, what about closing costs? And, you know, it's a story. It's an illustration. Don't think of it too hard. But I I do like that story because I think it represents maybe a, a degree of savviness, you know, of being shrewd with your money. And it reminds us that we all want to be like that to some degree. We don't want to be negligent with our finances or anything of the sort. Uh, But what I'm going to be looking at today really doesn't have a whole lot to do with money per se, although I'm sure that's included, but it's more of the idea of being a steward of all that God has given us, all that God has given us. And by simply saying steward, we are acknowledging that everything that we have is not really ours, but it belongs ultimately and transcendently to God, and He entrusts us to manage His affairs well. And so, right off the bat, we're going to be asking the question, it's a personal question for each and every one of us to reflect on, what is it that God has entrusted us with? Whatever that might be, whether that be wealth and riches and finances, or it might be something else that God has entrusted us with, whether it be our family or other resources that we have. And I know of no better place to look at this idea in Matthew chapter 25. It's famously called the parable of the talents. It's really the parable of the three stewards. And what I want you to see in this passage is in some ways this is kind of related to our previous sermon series on context is everything. For this parable, context, as with anything else in the Bible, is everything. And we want us to think a little bit about the context of why Jesus gives this parable. The the context of this is that Jesus is reinforcing and, and teaching us through His apostles, through His disciples, that there is coming a day for Him to come back. And in that interim period between when He leaves and when He returns, how might He find us? Are we going to be negligent, or are we going to be irresponsible, or are we going to be wise stewards taking care of that which He has entrusted for us? And so, the whole point of this passage is really predicated on the idea that Jesus will one day return. And then the question is, what will He find us to be about? Will we be responsible stewards, or will we be irresponsible and evil stewards as we see in this story? Uh, when we talk about stewardship, I, I, this is not unique to me. This is something that uh, somebody else has said, but I, I do like this. We, we might think of the five T's of stewardship. The first one, again, that we all are going to think about is those financial resources that we have that somebody has called our treasure. It's not really our treasure, it's God's treasure, but what do we do with the treasure that we have? But other ways that we are to be stewards, we have to think about our time. Every single one of us has the same 24 hours a day. We have the same number of days in a week. How do we invest that time? Are we frivolous? Do we waste it? Or do we invest it wisely? 
What about our talents? And, and the word talent here is going to appear several times, but here by what I mean by that, it's just our natural God-given abilities. I can't sing a lick, so it would be irresponsible for me to lead you in worship and singing. You wouldn't want that anyways. So that's not one way that I'm going to invest my talents as a wise steward for God's church. But what are other talents that you might have? Some of you are like, well, I don't know what I do. And, you know, we're always looking for people to hold babies, you know? I mean, like, a lot of people can do that. Some of you can't, myself included. <laughs> but what talents, what unique abilities do you have? Another way that we can be a steward is we think about our personal temple. And by this, we mean our body. What foods do we eat? Are we slothful? Do we exercise? Do we take care of ourselves as best as we can? The last T, though, is one that often goes overlooked, but it's perhaps one of the most important ones of all. It's our talk. How do we invest our speech? Are we looking to build others up? Are we looking to entrust truth into other people? Are we looking to encourage? Are we also, in many ways, pulled by slander and pulled by uh, deception and, and, uh, and, and temptation to lie and to manipulate truth? How do we talk? How do we build others up? How do we tear others down. I think the question about Jesus returning, when is that going to happen, is a question that's often lost on many Christians. <laughs> we just don't typically live life in light of this. We should, but our own priorities and schedules and things that we're about oftentimes remove our focus on the certain reality that Christ is going to return at some point, first in the rapture, and then to come and set up His thousand-year kingdom and reign. Those Th those events bring a reconciliation, and so they should frame our understanding of how we live our life. So if Christ is going to return, how does that shape the way we live? How does that shape our priorities? I will also say if Christ was not going to return, your Christianity effectively falls apart under the weight of its own assumptions. Just as we would say that the resurrection of Christ is essential to you and I calling ourselves with some integrity of being Christians, Christ followers, we can't follow a dead Savior. We have to follow a living Savior. The resurrection is a necessity, a theological necessity. So also is the second coming of Christ a theological necessity. Everything that I've said up to this point and everything you've learned about Christianity effectively falls apart under the weight of its own assumptions if Christ does not physically return to this earth. Everything. Christianity becomes a system of do's and do nots, and that's about where it goes and where it ends. Uh, I've heard it said that uh, the two comings of Christ, his first coming and his second coming, are like giant supports and a giant suspension bridge. If you've been to uh, San, Fr San Francisco, you might think of the Golden Gate Bridge, and those two anchors effectively keep that entire bridge supported and if one crumbles, certainly the whole thing crumbles under its weight. And where we live is effectively between the first and second coming. We live on the bridge, if you will. That the second coming of Christ is a theological certainty. We just don't know when it's going to happen. Jesus gives this parable. It is really in this context of several of these stories or, uh, uh, or illustrations that he provides to really reinforce this point, uh, at the end of chapter 24, he talks about the parable of the righteous steward as well as the parable of the ten virgins in chapter 25. Here, we're going to be looking at the parable of the, uh, the talents uh, and, and how it relates to his coming. So read with me, beginning in verse 13, you'll get some of the context even in just the simple verse, and we'll go to verse 15. Jesus says, watch therefore... For you know neither the day nor the hour. And then he gives a story. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. And then he went away. Now, the master here, we're not told how he goes away, why he goes away, and how long he's going to be going away, only that he was leaving for a period of time. And to manage his affairs while he was gone, he appointed three servants. 
and he says, I, I'm going to entrust my possessions to them. Uh, what's interesting is we, we don't have a whole lot of understanding for how much a talent is. Uh, a talent uh, is technically a unit of weight. So it's not a, a monetary denomination. Uh, and, and so some scholars have speculated that a talent is basically the sum total of about 20 years of daily wages. So it, it is very likely that the master leaves and he entrusts not just some of his possessions, but all of his possessions to these three servants. And he entrusts them uh, to them in accordance to their own abilities. One that is perhaps higher up in the chain, if you will, has five, two, and one. You know, a, a steward is always mindful of the fact that what he is managing is not his. It reminds me of when I was in college. Uh, so I, uh, I interned for a church down there in, in Houston, Texas. And if you've ever been to Houston in the summer, it is oppressively hot, oppressively hot. I grew up there, uh, never want to live there again. I'll just kind of go on record to say that. Um, and, and the traffic is just as bad, but, but the heat is really oppressive. And my parents were actually gone, uh, and I was living at home at the time. My parents were gone. They, they took a week-long cruise, I think, in Hawaii. And it was just me and my older sister, and we were actually doing a really neat inner-city missions project at our church at that time for that week. And so we would serve, all of us as peers, college students, I mean, it was, it was a blast. We would serve at this church in, like, inner-city Houston. And then, you know, we're college kids, so what else are we going to do? From about 10 p.m. to, like, 2 in the morning, we would hang out. And uh, we would come over to the Frawley house because my parents were gone. Now, I'm going to say this, and, and hopefully I don't need to, but there were no drugs or alcohol, but we were having a great time, all right? <laughs> my parents have a pool, and that was probably why it was the destination of choice. On the last night, I think it was Friday night, my parents were scheduled to return on Saturday. The last night, the AC conked out in the house. And uh, that posed a problem. Because it quickly rose, you know, to like 85, like 90 degrees in the house. I think I stayed the night there. I think, uh, I don't remember. But I remember when my parents came back, I said, hey, welcome back. It's great to see you guys. By the way, the AC's out. I'm gone. <laughs> I mean, it's just so typical. Whenever you go out of town as parents, you come back to something breaking, right? And the reason why is because I was a steward over the, their house, but I didn't have the resources entrusted to me. I didn't even have the know-how and who to call, you know, to get their AC fixed. That was kind of their problem <laughs> in a lot of ways. I brought them a house that had the AC broken. And so the master gives the talents to the stewards. Uh, and, and effectively, what Jesus is doing is he's giving a story about himself. Now, you got to be careful in parables. You, you can't always say one-to-one -one on every single thing. That, that's not really the way to read parables. But here, clearly, the master is to be associated with Jesus himself. And he's entrusting his disciples to continue the ministry in his absence. And it is soon to depart from them. And it raises a really good question for us to all think about what has God entrusted you with? What has Jesus extended to you? Well, for me, I can put very key dates on what God has entrusted me with. May 31st, 2003, that was our wedding date. And I also have three other dates, August 25th, 2008, May 5th, 2010, and June 5th, 2012. Those are the birthdays of our kids. And so at least God has given me four people in my life that I'm to be a husband and a father. And God has entrusted these people to me that I would serve them and give myself to them in an honoring way to build them up, especially our kids, to lead them in a way that's righteous. And that's essentially what happens in the master's estate. Look, look with me in verses 16 and 17. You see various tasks that they go about on. So in verse 16, he who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. I love the, the, the word choice here. It's so powerful. It's immediately they didn't look around. They didn't go, you know, maybe we should get to this someday. There wasn't any kind of procrastination. Their master entrusted his resources to them, and then they wisely and immediately began to invest them into other people. They immediately take what has been given to them. You know, uh, some of you probably have tons of gift cards in your wallet. I, I'm the kind of person that when I get a gift card, I typically spend it within a week. 
if even that. Amazon gift cards go very quickly. Grocery gift cards, Visa gift cards go very, very quickly. But uh, it's astounding, especially during the holidays or coming up in a few months, very likely you will give a gift card or many gift cards to your loved ones during that time. And so at Christmas time, I'm told 39.2% of shoppers will give a gift card to a department store or something of the effect. 33.4% will give a gift card to a particular restaurant. So I'm no math scholar, but that's like over 70% almost, you know, and, and, and quite a few people get these. Now, I'm told, I think these statistics are probably old, but an average of $300 in unused gift cards reside in people's possession. So this is a reminder to you to go look in the drawers in your house, go take a look in your wallet to see if you have an unused gift card and expend it because it is a $41 billion unused industry. <laughs> if somebody gives you a gift card, it's with the expectation that you'll use it. The same thing is said here that the master entrusts his talents and his possessions to these stewards, and he expects them to go about and using them wisely. Now we find the last steward, of course, we know the temptations that he's under, if you know the story. Look at verse 18. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, there are some virtues here that we want to point out. The master entrusts the one talent to this steward. The steward says, I don't want to lose it. And in a world where there's really not a lot of safe deposit boxes or, you know, high yield savings accounts that he could have put in that have been, you know, um, insured by the federal government, there's none of that. And so he thought, you know what I'm going to do is something that a lot of people did in those days. I'm going to find a plot of land, perhaps on his master's property, dig a hole so that nobody knows where that hole is, entrust and bury the treasure to that hole, cover it up, and simply forget about it. We're not told about his motives. We can only surmise. But I think there might be a few things that we can speculate here why he did this. Maybe it was just simply fear. Maybe he had a fear of messing up, a fear of using that inappropriately. Maybe he had a fear or a, a, an apprehension in his own abilities. Probably it was more along the lines, though, of just outright negligence. Maybe it was procrastination. Maybe he thought, I'll get to it someday. Maybe it just was a lack of research. Maybe he didn't even know how to turn in a, a profit. And the other stewards, we see that they double the investment through their own shrewdness and intuition and, 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 and abilities. But, but this man, he, he doesn't do any kind of research. It's very likely that he's acting selfishly. He says, well, you know what? I'm just going to bury it in a hole, not worry about it, and I'm going to go about my own life. And I think that last point is probably true. and would be one that we can all relate to. He says, well, it's not my money, that's my life, and I'm going to go about it and do things my own way. R regardless of the reason that we might look into it, I don't think Jesus is answering that directly, at least here, so that we might surmise and speculate and connect ourselves to this particular steward in the story. And that brings the tally, and this is the longer section that I want to read, and it's verses 19 to 28, and it's when the master comes back and he settles accounts with his servants. Look with me in uh, verse 19. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing the five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And then for redundancy in verse 22, and he also had, uh, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, I love this, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant, 
You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at coming I should have received what, I, what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. We're not told how long the master was gone, only that he was gone a long time. And so if you're just thinking about this in the scope of you know, current history, Jesus ascended into heaven sometime maybe 30, 33 AD. There's speculation on both. And here we are in 2024. It's been a long time. <laughs> it's been a long time between his two comings, right? And the tendency for all of us is to be like the last ser- servant, to simply move on with our life, pretend like it doesn't really matter. He's not really coming back. Only it's guaranteed that he will return. And I love how the tenses change in this. So, you know, in verse 19, the tense changes. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. He, he, it's in the present tense. And Jesus does this to add some vividness to the story. Oh, so he was gone, but now he is here. And just as any master would do, he is reconciling with his servants. He is calling them to give an account. So the first two slaves, there is a repetition here, and it's intended. Now, I don't want us to get locked up on why one had five, why the other had two, even why the other one had one. I don't find that to be all that important in the story. I think what is important, though, is what they say and what the master says. They give an account. They show that there has been a doubling of the resources Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a little, now you get to be faithful in much. Embedded in this, this is certainly the joy of what we call an eschatological joy. What I mean by that is it's a joy of when Christ returns, that he would find us, find you and me uh, invested in his work, doing the things that he has expected us to do, that we would be faithful in what he has called us to be. But the third slave is really interesting. And it's not just that he didn't do what he was supposed to do. It's what he projected and what he said to his master that I think is most illuminating. He said, I knew you to be a hard man. You have to stop and ask yourself for a second, why didn't the first two servants reflect that understanding? I think it's very simple. The first two servants actually knew their master. And maybe they knew him to be a hardworking man, but not a harsh man. And you hear the grace and you hear the love and the adoration in his commendation, well done, good and faithful servant. But the last servant doesn't really know his master. He's projecting something on him that he's assuming. And he's also, uh, in many ways, uh, avoiding his responsibilities because of that projection. He assumes his servant to be evil. Now, what happens is that gets flipped on its head. And the master says, you wicked and lazy slave. He recognizes that he has a failure of worth ethic. He also has a failure of character. And here is where we finally get the answer why he neglected the resources that he was entrusted to. Ultimately, he fails in his character and he fails in his work ethic. And those two are really brought together. Reminds me of a story about a man in January 2010. I read this some time ago. His name was Jeff Miller, not Jeff Miller, one of our elders, but Jeff Miller, who uh, lived in the Chicago area. And uh, if you've ever been to Chicago, there's an ESPN sports zone that you can go to. It's like a restaurant, sports bar kind of thing. And they had a contest for somebody who could be the greatest couch potato. (laughs) <laughs> and so the contest was you had to sit in one place. I, I suppose you got some restroom breaks, but you couldn't fall asleep and you couldn't disengage. You know, this is before the day of smartphones. You had to be there in presence and, 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 and work hard at your craft of watching sports for hour upon hour upon hour. And Jeff Miller evidently was a champion. He was a three-time champion, if you will, for 72 hours straight. (laughs) He watched sports. And I love what his girlfriend has to say after he won. Just listen to this. 
He's driven in everything he does. <laughs> Gushed girlfriend Barbara Carkville, I think is how you pronounce her name, explaining how her boyfriend's real estate business affords him time to sit these days. Nevertheless, he's 26 years old. That's just staggering to me. But here's what she went on to say. Most people have no idea what it takes to win. They don't understand the endurance it takes to stay awake and control bodily issues. Jeff is uniquely qualified. He's an expert. <laughs> I know that's got to have some degree of satire to it. Now listen to the tragedy, though, and then we'll get to some application. Verses 29 to 30. Jesus goes on in his story, and this is how he ends it. And the way he ends parables are oftentimes the most important of all. He tells us what this is all about. He says, For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's an interesting and yet sobering reminder that Jesus is going to have us give an account. Now, the question, of course, then, is where is the location where he's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth? And it's an interesting question, and I think you can make a lot of mistakes with parables when you start to squeeze them too hard, but I think it's pretty clear when other ways and other uh, passages where Jesus uses this expression that this person is not just excluded from some sort of rewards, but he's excluded from an eternity with Jesus. So we would say it this way, that he's not a believer, he's not saved, he's not regenerate. He, his heart is far from God he, he neglects that which he has been given and entrusted to in this story because ultimately he doesn't even want to be a servant. He doesn't want to be in the service of his master. And it is on the basis of that fundamental rejection that the master rejects him. It's not because the master doesn't like him, but because that rejection had already taken place. But it reminds us of the biblical, biblical truth which is somewhat sobering, but here's where we get to the application. Every single one of us, if we are a follower of Jesus, will give some sort of an account. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 5.10 says about Paul, what Paul wrote, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Several other places we read of this giving of an account as well as here. Now, we need to understand something that the Bible describes in the book of Revelation, what's called the great white throne judgment. And when you read that, it is clear on that passage that those that stand before Christ at the great white throne judgment, it is not an evaluation of their deeds, of their service for Christ. It is effectively a sentence. And so, as believers in Jesus Christ, here's the good news. We are ultimately uh, absolved of that judgment. We need not fear that kind of great white throne judgment. That is not reserved for us because the judgment that we were ultimately due was given on our behalf through Christ and that Christ paid the judgment of death. And so that effectively has been removed. We need not fear. And yet there is still another accounting that takes place. And the accounting that takes place is where Jesus takes an assessment of what we have been given. Some of us have been given much. And the question is, what have we done with it? And then the question really is, how are we faithful? Are you using your time wisely? Are you investing spiritually in those that have been entrusted to you, whether it be your spouse or your children or grandchildren? Are you investing your resources in your local church not for the purpose of the church just getting wealthy, of course, but so the church can partner with you and you can partner with the church in your financial endeavors to reach people for Christ. These are the questions that we are to ask. Are we being faithful? So I'm going to leave us here with three application points that we can ask ourselves on an individual level, but we can also ask ourselves on a corporate level as a church. The first thing is, and one of our stated core values in our church is that we have intentional investment. The first question I would just ask us is, are we intentionally investing into our youth? Are we, are we investing into our young people? 
whether that be toddlers or children or students or college-age students. I mean, you can always look and see people down the chain from you. Are you investing and are we investing into those young people? Our young people in our church, they, they indeed are our greatest treasure, if you will. They are our greatest resource. And what is it that we are to entrust them with? Well, it's a deposit of truth. It's a deposit of the gospel. It's also helping them to think and helping them to discern and evaluate the other conflicting messages that they'll hear everywhere in our world today. How are we doing with that? Do we leverage things like youth groups and Metro Kids and Awana? Do we leverage these programs, not just because they're programs and it's a place to put the kids when we don't want to be around them at church, but are they programs for the purpose that they have the resources of truth invested into them? Number two, let us be a church that remembers the past, that remembers the heritage and the traditions and the, and the great things that this church has been part of. You know, I, whenever I do new members classes, I'll do one starting next week, I, I always tell people that are interested in our church, and I said, this is no lie. You know, Metropolitan's roots have gone very, very deep in the city of Oklahoma City, all the way back to about the 1930s. And it is hard for us to find a ministry that is in some way, you know, detached, you know, through several degrees uh, of, of ministry from this church. In fact, what you often find is there has been someone that has been going to church here, maybe back in the 50s, they started a ministry, and then that ministry gave birth to another ministry, and then it ends up just being this tentacle and spiderweb out of metropolitan. It's really astounding, and I don't say that to brag on us as a church. I, I, I don't think that we want to just take pride in that as a badge of honor, but just to say that our church has been part of some amazing things in the city and also around the world. That said, we don't ever want to be crippled and idolize the past, because the past is the past. We want to instead continually look to the present and look to the future. So I've said it this way, we don't want to idolize the past, but we want to draw from it. Because we always are called to live in the here and now. We're always called to rethink our methods, our understandings, and we live in a world that's very different than it was 50 years ago, 30 years ago, even 10 years ago. Our world keeps evolving and changing. So let us take care of that. The last thing I would say is this. If we really want to be about the business of stewardship, we must entrust ministry and ministry responsibilities to young people. And what that means is that they're going to do things differently than the way we perhaps did them before. But that's good, that's healthy, because there's coming a day, in fact, it's already arriving when millennials and Gen Z will lead the church and lead churches. How can we do this effectively? Well, I, I had a chance to spend a lot of time with Caleb Rowland this last week and remind you that Caleb Rowland, those of you that haven't been here that long, he was our pastoral resident that we called here. He served here for a number of years before he went and launched uh, a new church plant called Gathered Community Church. It meets in the north side YMCA uh, in the north part of Oklahoma City. And there were a number of people that left our church to go do that. And why did we do that? Well, the reason why is because we took what has been entrusted in this church in the gospel message, and we planted a new church and a new community. And Caleb shared with something with me that is wildly encouraging. He said, you know, we realized that now we have, so if we brought a group of people from Metropolitan to start this church, for every one person we have that came from Metropolitan, now we have another person that has joined us that was not part of Metropolitan Bible Church. That's astounding. That means their church is growing and it's healthy. Yes, it's still vulnerable, but it is so beautiful. And let us be about these things. This last week, sorry to embarrass you, son, my 16-year-old son got his driver's license, and that's scary. Everybody's looking at you. So it's also really, really exciting. And when you teach a young person to drive, they usually go to driver's ed, and they don't just say, here's the keys to the car, let us know how that goes, come back in three hours, and we'll just kind of reconcile from there. No, they have an instructor in the passenger seat, and that instructor has a brake pedal that he can press to keep the young driver from wrecking or causing all kinds of problems. So when we entrust young people into ministries, we don't just let them go and just say, hope it works out for you. We continually come around them offering encouragement and coaching and support and love the last thing I would say is when we talk about stewardship, we can't not look at the ministry of Jesus. Jesus is and was the perfect steward. He took 
and he fostered the responsibility that he was given by his father to lead, to teach, ultimately to die on our behalf. Today, as 